Good morning, everyone. It's a very rainy day outside. Lots of rain coming down. Driving from Norwich Walk, there was a sign on the road, of course, saying, be caution of hydroplaning. Because if you're going too fast on the wet road, you can go off the road. So just a reminder to sometimes we have to take it slow. We have to go slow. And I think that's um, important throughout life, right? We need to be reminded sometimes to slow down. And the result of that, of course, is that sometimes we stop and think about the things that are really important to us. And one of the most important things to us, of course, as Christians, is to gather together. So despite the rain and the blustery weather, you're all here today. So thank you for being here today and for gathering in our Lord's name. Uh, before we get started, we usually ask if there are any announcements, and I think there's at least one right here. Morning. Happy St. Patrick's Day. I hope you're all wearing your green. Anyway, uh, I'm Don Kanegi, by the way, if uh, some of you new folks don't know me. Uh, I'm a trustee property committee chairman, Biles Fund administrator and spender, also the project manager for all things that need to be repaired and upgraded around this big facility. I thought I'd stop this morning and tell you about the plastic and the bucket that you're walking around when you come into the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. It's not a roof leak. It is a masonry that needs repointing in the bell tower. I've had uh, two contractors look at it. I don't have a price now, but uh, just yet. They're coming. Uh, we'll probably try and do something in stages because it's not going to be, how should I say, less expensive. Uh, so that bucket and the plastic may be there for a while because even when the rain stops, the masonry has acted like a sponge and it'll keep dripping even when the sun is out until we warm up and it dries out the tower. Uh, because of uh, probably global warming, who I know you've all heard about, the last few years of wind-driven rain and so forth and so on has soaked the mortar joints and they act like a sponge and it keeps draining down the inside and outside of the bell tower. And choir, by the way, that's why that hallway is wet upstairs when you walk into the choir room. So we'll try and fix it, uh, but it'll going to take a while. And anybody listening, if you'd like to contribute a lot of money to help, we're always here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Don. Very well said. Uh, are there any other announcements this morning? Anything that needs to be mentioned? If not, Would you all please join with me now in our call to worship this morning, which is taken from Psalm 51. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter and purer than snow. Do 
do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. May we sing of that deliverance, stand and sing together hymn number 286, which is in the New Century Hymnal, Spirit, Spirit of Gentleness.
as we have gathered today in our Lord's name, let us come together in prayer. May we pray together this morning's invocation. Let us pray. Come, O Creator God, come. Come and be with us and in us and beside us and over us. Be as hands upon us and fashion us by your will. Be as strength beside us and shape our lives today. In Jesus' name, amen. Be seated. I was once told that there is no greater gift to give than a gift of ourselves. And of course, that's really kind of open to a lot of interpretation. And because gifts are varied and uh, many and in terms of how they are preceded and how they are given and how people accept them. But a part of giving, of course, is, is maintaining what you have and what other people have, and that's part of a community. Um, I know here in Augusta there's a lot of discussion about how to uh, continue to maintain all kinds of things, like roads and businesses and to take care of those who are unhoused and to be able to do all this in some kind of a swell, fell swoop and make sure everybody's taken care of. What a big challenge that is for city leaders to be able to have to try and come up with ways to do this. And so they give of their time, but they're also asking within the community to give of resources, and that includes money. Um, and that includes the church. As members of this church, we are asked to give and to share even as God, through Jesus Christ, did that throughout the life of Jesus and beyond. And we understand this through the scriptures as they are taught to us and as we read them. Remember the words of Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Each one must do as he or she has made up their mind to do, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I will not offer the Lord my God that which has cost me nothing. As we understand and ascribe to the Lord the glory to God's name. Bring an offering and come into God's courts. So in that spirit, may we have this morning's offering.
for the ability and the wherewithal to give and to share within a community and to care for others through what we share. We give thanks, God, for that and for so much more. Bless these offerings by your hand and may they be used for the continuation and the building of your kingdom here on earth. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. May the children come down front for a few moments, if you'd like. Come on up. Come on down. I'm going to stand up today a little bit because I want to show you something. You know, one of the things... Hey, hey, Brooke, come on, Ava. Come on up here. Watch out for that cord. You're good. One of the things we're going to be talking about and, and kind of thinking about today as a part of our church service is being obedient. That's a big word, right? It's a big word. And, and really what it means is, is that when somebody is in a place of authority, somebody like a teacher or a, or a mom or a dad or a grandmother or a grandfather or somebody like that asks you to do something that, that you're willing to do it, right? What do you think, Ava? You got your hand up. What do you think about that? She has something that she wants to say. Go ahead. Um, a snowman melts. A snowman does melt. Yes, it does. Snowmen melt. And, and in a way, I, I guess... Uh, a snowman's kind of obedient to the sun because the sun melts the snow and the snowman melts, right? And so we're, we're not snowmen, are we, right? We, we have the ability to say yes or no, to do what somebody asks us to do or not to. But God wants us to be obedient to God. And our parents want us, and, and, and grandparents and people who care for us, want us to be obedient to them. In other words, they want, to do, want us to do what they ask us to do. 
because there's a lot of reasons, right? They want us to grow up safely. They want us to make good decisions. They want us to learn good things, right? What do you think about that, Ethan? You think it's important to be obedient to like mom and dad? Yeah. Why is it important? I'm putting you on the spot. I don't know. Is it because you love them? Yeah. Yeah, you love them. So, yeah, I'm pretty sure you do. I'm pretty sure you do. See, one thing God doesn't want us to do is to just to be obedient because God says, do it. Right? So in other words, it's kind of like this, this toy. I was showing Ethan this toy this morning. You know, God doesn't want us to be like a wind-up toy. This is a wind-up toy. God doesn't want us to be like this. You know, that somehow we just get wound up. We get told this is what we're supposed to do. And then we just do it. Right? He's kind of funny, isn't he? I'll try him one more time. He's kind of fun to watch. See, we're not like wind-up to- toys, are we? We have a brain that makes us think and helps us to make decisions. And so God doesn't want us to be just wound up and do what God wants us to do. Right? Do you think you're a wound up, wind-up toy like that? I don't think so, right? No, God wants us to be obedient because we want to. Because we love God, right? God doesn't want us to do things just because it's just the thing to do and we're supposed to like a wound up toy and wind us up and we go and do it. We do it because we love our moms and dads and the people who care for us. We love our teachers in a way because they're teaching us how to, to learn. And so we want to, we want to be obedient. That's what God wants us to do. He wants us to be obedient, not because we have to, but because we want to. Ava, you have something you want to say to that? Uh, a tomato melts all of the snowman. Yeah, I think I understood that. Do you love, you love your mom, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that means that, what, you should try and do what mom asks you to do, right? When she says to, for example, to clean your room or to pick stuff up. You don't do it because you have to. You do want to do it because you want to please your mom, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's really important to understand that God just doesn't want to do things because we're, we just have to do it or God tells us to do it or that we're scared of God. We shouldn't be scared of God because God loves us. We should do it because we want to. Ethan, you want to say something about that? You drop. That's okay. He's, he's all right. He's just, he's just down there waiting to get wound up again. He's not like us, right? We have decisions to make and the hope is that we do the right thing and show care and love for the people who love us by listening to them and obeying them. Right, Ben? Exactly. Let's pray about that. We thank you, God, that you create within us a heart that's willing to listen and to understand. And we just pray, God, that each of us, because of the love that we have for you and the people around us that care for us, that we'll listen to those who, who help us and want the best for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now walk slowly because you have something special today um, as a part of Sunday School. I think you're going to have a musician come and talk with you about a particular um, composer. first reading today is from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 31, verses 31 through 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me 
from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Our second reading is from the letter of Paul to the Hebrews, chapter 5, verses 5 through 10. In the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest, but God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience from what he suffered, and once made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. The word of the Lord. This morning's gospel reading is taken from the gospel according to John, the 12th chapter, verses 20 through 33. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. And they came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Well, Philip went and told Andrew, then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour is come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, there will, my, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. And the crowd standing there heard it and said that it was thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered, this voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. May God add God's blessing upon the hearing and the reading of these words. Please remain seated and let us sing together hymn number 522 in the New Century Hymnal. I love to tell the story.
May we pray together. We thank you for the gospel story and for the hope that is nestled within those words which help us to move through this life and even to the next. We pray today, God, that as we continue on this journey that we know as Lent, that as we look forward to the risen Christ as a part of our celebration, that we learn of obedience and what it truly means in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Obedience. It's one of those aspects of our, our faith that is either kind of, it seems to me, kind of welcomed in by folk and saying, yes, I am obedient to God, I am obedient to the gospel, I'm obedient to those who in places of power. And then there are some, like I was and tend to still be, to question places of power or even question exactly what obedience means. What does it mean to be obedient? Particularly as a part of our faith. I I read this story that comes out of antiquity uh, about a Sir Leonard Wood. True story. And he visited the king of France, and the king was so pleased with him coming that he invited him to dinner the next day. And so the next day came, and Sir Leonard went to the palace, and the king, meeting him in one of the halls, said to him, Why, Sir Leonard, I did not expect to see you. How is it that you are here? Did not your majesty invite me to dine with you? said the astonished guest. Yes, the king said, I invited you to come, but you did not answer my invitation. So that was when Sir Leonard Wood uttered one of the choicest sentences of his life, which kind of rings down to us today. He replied, a king's invitation is never to be answered. It's simply to be obeyed. I read that story this past week, and it kind of resonated with me in all sorts of ways. Is that how we are to look towards those in places of authority? Is that the same way way we are to look towards God? I'm not sure. I also read about, and I might have shared this with some of you at a different time, but it's worth speaking about again today. Uh, I read about, again, about during the Great War, that is World War I, when it broke out. Uh, what was known as the Australian Commonwealth, which was Australia, uh, which was a part of the Commonwealth of England. Um, They were asked by England, by Great Britain, uh, if they would offer some support. And of course they said, yes, what would you like us to do? And the reply was was very adamant from, from England at that time. It was, build us some ships. We need ships to fight this war. We need ships, warships. We need ships that will you know, bring cargo and, and bring supplies back and forth. Build us ships. But it's interesting to note that the Australians didn't build ships. History shows this. They did not build ships. They, they tilled fields. They sowed seeds. They reaped harvests like, like crazy. And they decided to send food to England. They decided to send food, and they put grain into sacks, um, and they gathered up all these sacks of food, tons of food, brought it down to the water's edge to ship it over to England to put it on ships, but there weren't any ships. Remember what England asked for? They asked for ships, and the ships never came to pick up the food. And so mice got into the grain, and they found, not only they getting into the grain, but they found their way into the Australian countryside and into their towns, and they were carrying diseases, and part of the disease was, a, was some sort of a disease that caused blindness and deep, deep uh, illness, and so people were blinded and were sick. And all the time... The understanding was, at least from England's point of view, we asked for ships. We wanted ships. We didn't want all that. And the result was, of course, something that was really horrendous that happened. 
This reminds me of the understanding of obedience and the consequences that can come about when we are not obedient. That is, when we don't listen to the needs that are passed on to us from those who may be in places of power or from those whom we ask to help. I mean, really, when you stop and think about it, all the Australian folks had to do was just obey. They just had to listen to what, to what England had asked them to do. They said they did almost just the opposite. And I think that's the other thing it remind, I'm reminded about with being obedient, is that when those in places of power, or particularly when our Lord asks us to obey, it's not for some kind of covert reason. It's because it's what's best for us. It's for what's best overall. It's the greatest good. That's what God wants from us. Not to put us through some kind of a, 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 a abstract kind of way of living in which we're trying to figure out or guess what God wants us to do. God says, just simply obey me. As the song says, we're going to read, uh, sing in a little bit. Trust and obey. It's not a trick question. It's not about trickery. It's about doing what's best for us in God's name. So, what about this, obedience? Well, I have to say this as well, that obedience has, has never been one of my favorite subjects. Uh, growing up, I was always kind of pushing back like so many young people do, and part of me still has this kind of little bit of a edge to myself where I want to question authority or exactly what authority is. It's hard for me. And apparently other people feel the same way. And you, I hear about it all the time as a part of my kind of work or also as a part of my daily living with people. You know, the, the idea of kids obeying parents is sometimes there's a big gap there and a lot of problems, a lot of edginess. Employees really obeying or listening to what their boss wants them to do. Uh, patients and doctors. A lot of people come in my office and they say, my doctor asked me to do this and I just don't think it's right. I don't know what they're thinking of. I'm not going to listen to him. And it comes down to this this phrase that often is uttered, again, by young people, but it's in our hearts and heads for those of us who don't want to obey. We say to ourselves or we say out loud, you can't tell me what to do. You're not going to tell me what to do. So, is obeying such an awful thing? Is it one of those things that just kind of goes against our grain? Today's scripture points to Jesus' example of obedience through, as the writer of Hebrews says, reverent submission. I mean, Jesus did this out of submission to God's will, knowing that God wanted the best for God's creation. The writer puts it this way, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. There's a kind of a, a little bit of a formula here if you, if you pay attention to the, to the readings. Um, being obedient is often an emotional thing. It requires us to kind of put aside our own feelings uh, while still experiencing them and to listen anyway. It's emotional. I mean, we, we read that Jesus cried to God for help. Going to the cross was not going to be easy. Many times we're asked to do things in life, and you all know this, that aren't easy, but they're the best thing to do. When we're asked to obey God, sometimes it's difficult. We're asked to do things as a church, as individuals, that are sometimes hard. They call upon us to put aside our own emotions and to listen to what God wants us to do. It's emotional. And, and Jesus also was very quick, to, as an example to us, to call upon the one who was in charge to help through this process. It says that Jesus prayed to God for guidance. When we're in those midst of times when we're having to make a big decision or we're having to really think about obedience, whether to God or to some other form of, of, of higher up, perhaps, in our lives, um, we have to think about that and we have to ask God for God's guidance in the midst of that. I mean, it's very important. Um, my son-in-law, Jeremy, who's not here today, as many of you know him as the manager of uh, Sherwin-Williams, uh, at least he used to be here in, in Augusta. Now he's in Waterville, a little closer to home. Um, 
he was, he was a wonderful guy and, and a really good manager of, of Sherwin-Williams. And when he was asked or was considering moving on to another position, he took a lot of time with it. And I know it was difficult for, for my daughter, it was kind of difficult for me, but he was like, I've got to really think about this. And he told me, I did a lot of praying about this to really make sure this is, this is what God wanted me to do, to know this is what was the best thing to do. But it took some time. Jesus took the time really to ask God for God's guidance and being obedient and just to help him go through what he needed to go through. We should do the same thing. You know, in those times when we're really questioning to be obedient, we don't need to just jump on the bandwagon with other people or, you know, oh, no one's going to tell me what to do, have that attitude. Take time to pray. Think about it. Take time. My dad used to talk about taking five. Take five before you make a decision. And sometimes he said to me, take five means sometimes five hours, five days, five weeks. Take your time before you do a rash decision or make a rash decision. Jesus did. And then this is important too. In the end, Jesus respected God's decision. It tells us that he respected and he gave into and understood the importance of God's decision, respecting his heavenly parent. And there's a deep sense, too, that when we're obedient and we really take that time to have that obedience resonate within us, we come back to the great conclusion, particularly, of course, in our relationship to God and our faith, that God is in control. And we need to listen to that voice, if you will, that spirit in our hearts and heads above any others. Taking time, an emotional journey sometimes, but coming to the understanding in our faith that God will make the right decision for us if we're willing to listen to and adhere to that decision. In a word, Jesus was obedient to God. Obedience that is adhered to in the face of a difficult situation, Jesus faced that difficulty and adhered to God's decision in his life. And that included him having to go to the cross something that he at one point even says that I was born to do. So, if Jesus was obedient, why do we so often struggle with it? If we recognize that Jesus was obedient in the face of a very difficult time and obedient to those things which are difficult in his life, I mean, even at one point when he was questioned about a particular aspect of what he was preaching, he even said, render unto God what is God's and render unto Caesar, render unto the government what is theirs. Be obedient. This is sometimes difficult, isn't it? To consider all aspects of obedience. If Jesus was obedient, why do we often struggle with it? Well, I think these are, there's some very, really important reasons here. Many of us feel that we need to do something in our faith to, to fulfill it. That is, we're kind of thinking about working to get into heaven by the use of our resources, that we need to use our abilities and by using our abilities that somehow we're going to be good enough, do the right thing enough, that God is going to recognize us and say, hey, come on over to heaven in the end. That's not how it works. You know, the, the, the magician Houdini, I was reading he could get out of any locked jail, except one. There was one that he could not get out of. It was a little jail in the British Isles. And he tried, and he tried, and he tried all these different things for two hours that often would always work for him. And, and as the story goes, finally he was exhausted and frustrated, and he leaned against the door, and guess what? The door was unlocked the whole time. It opened up on him. Sometimes we want to work too hard, and that really is the best way to do it. We want to work too hard for God, when all we need to do is to believe in our Lord and follow our God's lead and God's spirit. The door is open so often we just have to walk through it and we make it too hard. And for that reason, we, we push back against God in a sense of uh, an obedience that's too hard to do, that it's too hard to follow what God wants us to do. In fact, it's very simple. God forgives us because of Jesus Christ and our belief in Christ. That's the grace. That's the way. The door is open, we just have to walk through it. Sometimes we think we have to work too hard and we get discouraged and push back against obedience and in a sense really isn't even there. And many of us are brought up to do it alone. We've got to do it alone. We've 
got to go at it alone. We're very stoic sometimes. But this is the big question. You know, can't we accomplish so much more when we work together? I mean, isn't that just kind of logical? When we try to do things by ourselves, we're limited. No matter how wonderful we are, no matter how many gifts we have, we're one person. And when we try to do things on our own, we are still limiting ourselves. No matter how good we are at whatever we're doing, we can do it better with somebody else. We can accomplish so much more when we're with other people. You know, you read about the great Tom Brady. We all remember Tom Brady, right? Remember back in the day how wonderful he was? And he got all the glory. But he was very quick to point this out, and if you stop and think about it, it's very logical. Uh, He couldn't have been the great quarterback he was without a team around him, without a line of of men that protected him when he was dropping back to pass, when he had a defense that was able to stop the opposing team. And, of course, there was the great coach, Belichick, who was a part of this whole process as well. It took a team for really Tom Brady to be the great quarterback he was. He did not win all those games, despite what some people might like you to think, by himself. It took a team. The church is a team. It really is. We could say it's a holy team, but it's a team that does not function without reverence, obedience, and with everyone working together in a sense of that obedience, that reverent obedience to God. Giving all the while to God's glory what we do and accomplish as the community that is known as the church. That's how God set it up. That's what Jesus did when he went around the countryside gathering up disciples. Notice he didn't just grab a couple. He grabbed grabbed 12 12 apostles, and there was a whole bunch of other people that followed along with him. It took a team for the church to start. It takes a team for the church to to stay relevant within the world. It takes all of us working together. When we start thinking about going it alone, we're pushing back against what God wants within God's church. And the, the idea, of course, is if we push back against it too hard, we're going to get discouraged. And obedience suddenly becomes something difficult. And then there's this, the final thing that comes, up, comes to mind for me. It is a, a great accomplishment, maybe a greater accomplishment it would be within society to do things our way and find that success by ourselves than to find ourselves connected to other people. We become kind of obedient to ourselves and we feel like this is the most important thing we can do, just do what we want to do. As opposed to following the examples of other people. You know, there is nothing shameful, if you will, and I hate to say it that way, about listening to and following the example of someone else who's come before us and found success. I love reading biographies. They're very very much a part of my reading time. And we we lift up inventors and leaders and individuals and and all these wonderful people throughout history who seemingly... um, were able to accomplish great things out of thin air by themselves. You know, Edison and Franklin and Jefferson and Napoleon and and, and the list could could go on and on and on. Martin Luther King. I mean, we could we could go on and on. They seem to just be able to do all these things by themselves. However, and I and I ask you to you know if you doubt this to look these these folks up yourself. In reading about these individuals, all of them had many influences that they chose to follow, that is to obey, that led them to greatness. They built upon the greatness of other people. For example, just a few examples, Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. He didn't just come out of that, come out with that in his head, you know, one day or after a few days. He built upon the European works of the philosopher David Hume, who had written many of the very same things that Jefferson put to work, uh, put to words in the Declaration of Independence. There's nothing wrong with that. He just used them in a slightly different way. But he didn't just come up with them on his own. He was listening to and feeling the, 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 the feelings and the words of another person and saying, ah, oh, this makes sense. I'm going to listen to this. I'm going to obey this. It's a part of my own philosophy. And that's how the Declaration of Independence was developed. And then, of course, Edison. We always read about, well, you know, great Edison. Of course he was a great, brilliant man. Never graduated from high school. Uh, but he wasn't without his own, um, his own heroes, if you will, his own people that, that really brought him to the place where he was in his inventor. He read continually about people like Newton 
and about Benjamin Franklin and their work, and he put them into practice in his own. In a sense, he was obedient to what they already had learned so that he could, he could put his own kind of take on it. But he didn't just do it on his own. And then, of course, we read about Napoleon. There was a movie out just recently about Napoleon. Um, you know, he, he had his own heroes. He followed the, this, the strategies of Julius Caesar and Alexander the Great. Those were people in his own time and in his own words. He lifted up and said, yes, these are the great generals that I'm listening to in my heart and head. People don't come up with these things and do things just out of thin air. There are influences. And I would say it this way, too. No one accomplishes great things, really anything, without listening to or obeying the example of another. I really dare you to try to find someone who would be able to do that. So the question comes back to us. If that's true, then why not obey the one who is responsible for everything, our Lord. We don't have to climb to heaven to get it. We don't have to work our legs off to achieve it. If you found Christ, you found the way. And if you haven't, well, then I would encourage you to do that and put yourself in kind of a, a backseat position and be willing to follow and listen to other people's points of view. You know, many years ago on the political spectrum of things in the 1800s, uh, it was very common practice in our country that whenever someone was running for, whether it be a town council position or to run for, uh, well, even president of the United States, uh, the great majority of people would flock to the person that they were not supporting. Not to hiss and to boo them, but to listen to them and see if exactly they were saying the things that they were not willing to follow. They would listen to the people that they were not supporting more than the person that they were supporting, simply because that gave them a clear perspective. And in a sense, that's what we're asked to do in the church. We're supposed to put aside our own kind of desires and, and things that might push us in one direction, at least temporarily, so that we can listen to our Creator to listen to the one who is the creator of all things, that has made all things possible, and will continue to do so within each of us if we're willing to be obedient. Amen. As we come to a time of prayer, I would draw your attention to the names which are in the bulletin this morning. And... Um, I would ask if there are others to pray for today. Yes, Don. Uh, Richard Kimball, so our prayers are with Richard, who is, is facing some health issues and a biopsy. And uh, of course, he's a big part of our church community and our, and our church for many reasons. And so we pray for Richard today. Are there others? If not, let us come together in a few moments of silence and let us pray together. Loving God, we gather in the name of Christ who has called us friends. And in friendship, we come to share life with the one we love. Within this fellowship of your church, God, make Christ known to us. Make Christ known to us that we shall eagerly seek to please him in all that we say and do. May the glow of our Lord's friendship last into the coming days and be known to others as we share life with them. Lord, teach us that obedience is not a, a bad word, and in fact it is perhaps the greatest thing we can do as a part of our faith journey. Faith leads us to be obedient to you. So revealing God, we would see Jesus through the very spirit that you have sent to live in us. 
Open our eyes now to Christ's living presence as we attend to your word, as we come together as one, as we prepare to leave as your church. Your steadfast love to us is our joy, righteous God. We gather to rejoice in your salvation, to sing praises to you for all your healing gifts to us. You have called us to faith. We have listened. We have come. And you have given us the strength to live out that faith. May we be willing to share it and to give it to others. God of the quiet places, God of the stormy seas, we gather in your calming presence, prepared to do your will. So we ask that you silence the kind of crashing waves of trouble that may be in our hearts, and let us hear your promise to us in Christ's whispered, be still. Be still and know I am with you. And in our stillness, let us know within our whole selves that you and you alone are our God. We remember the words of Jesus when he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not let us fall into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May we close today's service of worship by taking a look at the insert that's in your bulletins this morning. And let us stand and sing together, trust and obey.
as we prepare to leave and as we do leave. May the very Spirit of God be upon your heart and be in your mind. Share with what you have learned today. Do it by sharing your words, but also your actions with others in the course of the week and the days ahead. Go in this peace and in this knowledge of our Lord. Amen.